and welcome to a new Harry's Garage and today's car is the Lamborghini Miura an amazing car and I saw this example come up for sale at the classic motor hub are just down the road from me I know them very well and I was straight on the phone please can I borrow the Miura and they said yes so here it is but in between me making a call and it coming in here uh, a gentleman has bought this car and he gave permission me to do this video so I'm very grateful to the new expectant owner this car is a, an amazing part of Lamborghini's history. Um, uh, Ferruccio Lamborghini was making the front engine cars and there was this group he'd, he'd employed, Bob Wallace, um, Delara, Stanzianzi, and they were young guys and they'd all come from a racing background and they really wanted Lamborghini to do a race car. And uh, Ferruccio Lamborghini was saying, no, not at all. You can make me a race car for the road. I don't mind that. Um, and they got to work and this is what they ended up with. Anyway, I'll go into the more detail, but let's have a look at this car under the skin, what makes it so special. I really like the S version because it still had those eye lattice above the headlights, such a distinctive feature of the Miura. And uh, I just think it's, it's all over is just this brilliant design. It was Batoni um, who did it at uh, the design house, but actually penned by Gandini. Although there's a little bit more to it, the story than that because when um, Ferruccio first went to them, they basically came up with the mid-engine idea. He then wanted them to clove it. And the first designer he put up on it was Cesario. Giorgio Cesario, he was working at Petoni at the time, but um, the, the bosses of Petoni thought he was going to leave and they wanted to give him a tasty project to work on. They didn't actually tell him what he was working on, just gave him the layout. But it didn't work and he went off to gear and uh, then um, Gandini came in and he was given the project and carried on from where Giorgio had got to. So two top designers and no wonder it looks wonderful but it actually is really Scandini's work in the end of the day. But what a car to have on your CV. The S version should actually have same size wheels front and rear. They're 7x15. This has got the wider, I think they're 9 inch rims from the SV and wider tyres. Uh, originally came with 205 regular 15 tyres and they got to a 205 70 tyre but it was basically the car was ahead of tyre technology so they just had to take what tyres were available by the time the SV was produced then there were low profile 60 profile tyres and that really changed how the car behaved and they could improve it to take advantage of the new tyres but anyway this is an S um, pure design purer design I think than the SV that lost the eyelashes and the lovely stylized badging and that S badge on the rear. Lamborghini had such flair and this is a standard colour. This is the car, colour this car left the factory in, in 1968. It's called a Verde which is just green. Now, you'd think they'd give it a really special name but no it's just green. They did orange as well um, but if I had a Miura I'd be highly tempted to have it in this colour. Okay one of my favourite bits of Lamborghini history is this book on Bob Wallace. This was done by um, a lady who worked at uh, Lamborghini um, through the very early years, Maria Guzzaradi, and she persuaded uh, Bob Wallace and did an interview with him and produced this book on the, with a sort of scrapbook feel on the very early days of Lamborghini. One of my favourite shots, look at that. Let's see, sitting at, sitting at about 260 kilometres an hour. And you see those gloves, if you actually look at another part of this book, if I open this, and here is Bob, oh, another Bob Wallace, and there is a set of his distinctive driving gloves that comes with the book. But when you turn to Miura, um, first of all, you just realise how young they were at the time. They're, you know, Delara, Stanzizi, and Bob Wallace. They're all under 25 when they designed this Miura, so they were just kids, just full of exciting new ideas. And the car they really admired was the Ford GT, the mid-engine. So they thought, well, let's see if we can do a mid-engine road car. Never been done before. And they started sort of, they said they had this chassis table and they'd moved blocks around and they were obviously had the V12 behind. But the little gems in this book, I never realised. And I'll just read a little bit here. We looked for new approaches to that. So our car was initially pretty well drawn up as a central seat, three seats car with central driving and a longitudinal engine. So the Miura, original, very right at the beginning, was going to be three seats, longitudinal engine. 
They then realised that it was packaging wasn't great, it was going to be quite long, it's too big. And they then thought, well, someone measured across the engine and it was quite small, 21 inches across. So they turned it around and made it transverse. And they thought, well, how are we going to do the transmission now? But again, at the same time, another car and I really admired was the Mini, and that had a transverse engine and a gearbox all t attached as one unit, and it was to the sort of behind the engine. So they said, oh, we'll do that, not really knowing how to do it. And that's where the complication. So they came up with the idea. Um, Fabrizio Lamborghini loved it so much, they put it on a show stand in 65, and it went, whoa, no body had been designed. And uh, big excitement, they're gonna make this mid-engine car. Then Bertoni got involved, then Gandini clothed it, and in 1966, it was shown, and the world went nuts. The world's first mid-engine road car being produced, the Miura, uh, took over the show. Ferruccio was handed deposits and money. They wanted to buy this car, and it sort of went into production before it was really ready, and they sort of then developed it on the hoof. So that's the background to the Miura. Let's go and have a look under the skin. The car has two very distinctive front and rear clamshells. They're aluminium, great big pieces. You release the front wheel here and lift it up. There was always slight nervousness that it's going to hit its nose on the ground, but it doesn't, thank goodness. And here we have the radiator right at the front. Um, there's battery and spare wheel here and the fuel tank. And you'll look at the front and it's very narrow at the front and the this, this car was sort of famous at speed it sort of had a lot of front end lift um, and that's why they sort of shoved all the heavy bits at this end actually weight distribution isn't bad it's uh, 45 front 55 rear and that's because at the rear if we go around to the rear this end i'll pull this out one one lever and again oh, oh, it comes because this engine is transverse and has the gearbox behind, it means the engine is very close to the passenger cell and it's within the wheelbase. There's no weight beyond the um, tires at the back. And that's why it's a pretty good weight distribu distribution on this car. Okay, it's a beautiful engine, this um, Bitferini did it. Um, it was a competition engine for Ferrari. They didn't want it. Lamborghini um, got him into the company, Ferruccio Lamborghini, and then it became their engine, Lamborghini's engine. But it's an extreme engine, over square, quad, quad cam, 8, 000, uh, revs to 8,000 RPM. Imagine that in the 60s. Very exciting car. And with the Miura, because up to now it had side draft carburetors for the Miura they could fit a race uh, carburetor which was down draft and I've just unscrewed this top here if I take one of these covers off there you go there's all the carburetor trumpets all lined up and obviously there's another set there it just looks like a race car as you soon as you do that um, distributors are this side spark plug was just underneath and they have this reputation Muras, and unfortunately reputation for catching fire because if you get any sort of fuel leak it drips down onto the head and if that um, fuel will actually arc out a spark plug and boof up it all goes so there's a bit of a problem but this has got plumbed in uh, fire extinguisher and brand new fuel lines, modern fuel lines, which is the, absolutely the right thing to do if you own a Miura. The other thing I noticed is it's got an oil cooler, which I don't think was standard in its day down there. It's got an electric fuel pump as well and a battery cutout, which again is essential. If you see any sinusar, flick that off and then you know the electrics is all dead. Um, so yeah, it's all safety on the Miura. It's how easy to get over if you know what the problems are. And there's so many experts now it's been in production for so long. The other thing I want to say is just the gearbox. You can't see the gearbox on it because it sits under this plate here. Um, very, very clever. All you can tell is two dry shafts going to the wheels. This end of the engine, I have a clutch just coming off the crank and it doesn't have a flywheel in as such because they say, well, actually flywheel weight is actually from the gears that then go across to the gearbox. And in the early days, they tried chains, they tried all sorts of drive to the gearbox and they ended up with these gears and that means they actually had to reverse the way the engine turned. So when it, Miura 1 and 2, the engine turned, I can't remember which way, one way, and then when they went for production, they had to make it spin the other way because of the gearbox. All lovely little details, shows how it was so at the beginning, this car, and they sort of made it up as they went along. But look what they ended up with. There's one final bit before we go out to drive it. Um, just wanted to read out another passage from that Bob Wallace book. 
with just this paragraph to just give you a background of how Bob Wallace's day, what it was like in those early days of Lamborghini. And he says here, if I just find the bit, yeah, I became chief tester driving the prototypes on racetracks, mountain roads and autostrada, averaging 600 miles a day. We start out, start out early, 5 a.m., before the traffic got heavy. With the Miura, you could go to Rome, 280 miles in two hours, 20 minutes. Then you could go Rome to Naples, 140 miles in less than an hour. All the factory's test drives would clock up in, on the autostrada toll gates and get them at Milan to modern a time. In those days, you used to get a ticket as you went through the barriers, and there was, they sort of were pinned on the nose board if you got a really quick time, because um, it was actually on the ticket. Um, where am I? Yeah, so my fastest time was 38, 39 minutes for the 105 mile distance from Milan to Modena. Um, that's averaging over 160 miles an hour. Just crazy days, but that was the early days of Lamborghini and they used to go and try and find, he says in here, um, used to try and find uh, Daytona or Ghibli with Prova plates on. So we'd run each other down the road. So it was just this mad competition between Maserati, Ferrari and Lamborghini. Anyway, we're not going to do that today, but now I'm going to close everything up and let's take this car for a drive. Okay, well the first thing you'll notice, I might have to shout in this car because it's all going on. It's quite an intense experience, the Miura. Lots of sound, that engine is just behind your head and there's sort of gear whine and yeah, refinement isn't up to today's standards, but they're all the right sort of noises. The other thing I'm going to have to do Although air conditioning was introduced on the 400S, it's not fitted to this model. So I'm going to open the window, um, which will make, hopefully you'll still hear me, but it's all going to be a bit more of a challenge than other cars, but I think it'll be worth it. I also say about this car, it's, it's sold, obviously. Um, it, was, it was advertised, I think they, they were asking uh, 1.3 million, and it sold in a couple of weeks, so it's obviously sold pretty close to that. Um, these are really valuable cars, so, but I'm internally grateful to them for letting me use it and just, yeah, so you can get the experience. Now, if you have a look at the dash and how it all works, you've got these two big clocks, um, a 300 kilometer an hour um, speedo and no red line and a 10,000 RPM tacker. We won't be using all those. Other gauges here, I can see it's charging, it's up to temperature, oil pressure's there, temperature of the oil is good as well, I'm really pleased to see the oil cooler. So anyway, I'm going to get myself out to the village and get on some, some better roads. Like the Lotus, it's quite tight in the cabin again. I find I, I'm, let's say, six foot one, six foot two, I can't cope with the sun visor, so I just have to fold that forward so I don't keep headbutting it. Everything's very close. The bulkhead is fixed, obviously, because of the, um, the engine. It's the, the seat runners don't go all the way back as much as you'd like. Wheel is quite a nice position, actually. It's not crazy out there, and your knees are sort of up by the wheel. Um, it's, not, I mean, it's just such an intense, there's no other car like it. And obviously, that amazing view out by looking in the mirrors, I see those carburettors and in the distance through the slats I can just about see behind me. Quite intimidating, it's wide, got one mirror, nothing on that side. So I am trickling, waiting to come through. You're also on the pedals, they're uh, floor hinged on this. So you're, yeah, that, that's not great. Um, quite heavy controls, the clutch, etc. Uh, and then the brakes, well, you really have to press the brakes. I don't believe there's a servo on it, and um, yeah, it's it's 60s style braking. I mean, on the air ventilation side, basically you've got windows in this model. There is, you can get it to demist, but there's nothing to blow air at you. Um, that was that was a, uh, something that came a lot later. Uh, a hill start in a Miura. Thank you very much. Was 
this car has been recently rebuilt, uh, beautifully done in the UK. It's done 6,000 kilometres since rebuilt, and it's a very fit example. I've been driving it around, and it runs superbly well. And it actually hot starts, which is um, a new one on me for a Bureau. Most of them really struggle hot starting. Um, so it sort of feels like a new car, there's no squeaks and rattles. Okay, the ride quality is better than you might expect, even on these tyres. I say this is quite um, street tyres. I think they're the 215 in the front, Avon tyres, sort of competition spec. Oh, 235 at the back, I think. Uh, might be 225, 235. An SV actually had 215, so it's oversized. 215 in the front, 225 in the rear. So it's slightly oversized on SV. Um, but they actually feel good behind the wheel, this car. Um, more direct, because Euras are one of those cars that vary massively depending on which example you drive. This is a good one. Not a lot. I need to shut up at the moment. Just put it in a third and just to give you a sense of the sensory overload again this car. idea uh, having the same oil for your gearbox and your engine particularly on an engine that revs to 8,000 rpm um, and by the SV they then had separated and you can put different oil in the gearbox and engine it's not a good idea because gearbox you obviously if you get a crunchy gearbox you're actually chance of wearing bits of metal out so you're highly reliant on oil filtration um, to get rid of those little bits before it went anywhere near the engine have to change the oil all the time on a Miura. Um, if you think you've crunched the gears, do an oil change. It's a bit like that. But it does mean there's quite a capacity of oil and um, the engine is wet some to this car. And it also meant that the gearbox is unique to this car and it's a conventional pattern. So first is in the normal place, five speeds, and then a lockout on reverse to stop you accidentally thinking there's a six gear there. The odd thing about the Mura compared to the Kuntash is the visibility out. The windows are all quite deep, um, so visibility front and side is great. It's a bit rubbish behind, but it's no worse than the uh, Kuntash. At least through the slats, I can actually tell there is a BMW um, following me. I couldn't do that in the Kuntash. I just know there's some sort of car there because I can just about see its windscreen. So I'm not saying it's a practical car. Oh, well, I didn't actually show you the boot. Obviously there's a boot that comes up in that rear clamshell. It's a fair size. It's just a bit odd if you ever have to check the engine because of the weight of that sort of, you suddenly realize, oh, I shouldn't have packed so much in my suitcases. I would like some ventilation though. I have to say that was a slight miss. Lord knows what it was like. Uh, in Italy when they were developing this car. Well, I suppose if you're doing a 150 miles an hour everywhere as Bob um, Wallace seemed to be doing, well, there was a reasonable flow of air through with the windows open. Escape the traffic. Cars, Mureas, and uh, that is a very healthy 
rated at um, 370 horsepower and about 7 8,000 RPM. Uh, this feels the easy 350 horsepower. back in the day. As you can probably tell, it is all encompassing. The, the sensations are everywhere. It's, it's um, engine chatter and induction bark. It's not all exhaust. It's everything. Steering, um, it's lively in the hand. It's uh, quite slow geared and the turning circle is London bus sort of diameter. It's not, it's not one to do three point turns in, as you'd expect. You saw basically drive from home, never think about parking. And then just driving over bit of the road. Oh! Sorry if I go quiet at times, but I'm sure you can understand why.
like the Countach. No need for a radio in this car. Just enjoy the sensation of this original supercar from Lamborghini.